We should be on Lecture 43, Regeneration, now. We have gotten a little behind, but I must finish the rest of 42. But we can do it very rapidly because I think we've developed the evangelistic method of seeking fully enough that you ought to be able to understand all of this uh, very uh, readily. So let me hastily complete the glance at Lecture 42, the last one on uh, seeking, starting with number two. In the case of sacramental evangelism, the evangelist is getting people to do something that is in their natural power, receive sacraments, but which can do nothing saving for them apart from the faith which is only in their hearts when God bestows it, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. As we've said, the sacraments themselves not only don't have the power in themselves, but God has never made a promise that every time the sacrament is properly administered, that that which it symbolizes is actually accomplished. We know too many people who have been baptized who've never been regenerated. We know too many people who have eaten and drunk damnation at the Lord's table. If everybody who was baptized was converted and perseverance of saints is at verity, you know a large majority of mankind, if not all, I think I could prove if I had time for it, all would be saved. Number three, in the case of surrender evangelism, the evangelist is urging sinners to do something which would indeed save them, but which they cannot do because of themselves. They never will. I keep reminding you that they cannot because they will not. It isn't that they don't have the faculties to say yes to Jesus Christ, but they have no disposition to do so because they love darkness and hate light. Number four, in seeking evangelism, the evangelist is exhorting sinners to do something they can do, which is admittedly non-saving and even sinful, but which puts them in the sphere where God usually works if he works savingly and makes them less sinful in the process. God and scripture are honored. The seeker is humbled. All proceeds for the greater glory of God and some certain benefit for the seeker, if not actual, salvation. Number five, all this is activity without a hint of Arminianism because this is activity of the flesh recognized as such, not activity of the regenerated spirit because that has not happened as Arminianism would suppose it to be. Number six, remember the evangelistic alternatives are really seeking or a shrug. And of course, shrug is no live option. We cannot copt out of our duty. We are commanded to make disciples, to preach Christ crucified to every creature, to become everything in our power to win some. Seven, one can see that seeking draws attention to the real evangelizer, the Holy Spirit. That was the very first point we made in the beginning of our discussion of this evangelistic subject. The Holy Spirit is the evangelizer, and you cannot miss that in seeking evangelism. You can in surrender evangelism because the key person is not the Spirit, even when he has a role in it, but the individual himself. In seeking evangelism, it is made plain that the seeker cannot produce that regeneration or saving faith. Only the Spirit can. You can hear Jesus talking about the birth from above and the Spirit who produces it being like the wind which blows where it will. And you see the effects of it, but you don't know where it comes or where it goes. You have no control over the work of the Holy Spirit who will change you or not as he pleases. And this alone, if there was nothing else in this whole discussion recommending it, should be the absolutely decisive evidence that seeking is the evangelism of God, the way the scriptures actually appoint. 
one can see that seeking draws attention to the real evangelizer, the Holy Spirit. Eight, the minister can't convert, the sinner can't convert, only the Spirit can convert in the sense of regeneration. See, conversion usually means that we turn away from the world we presently love in repentance and we turn to the Christ we pleasantly hate in faith and the process is called a conversion. Now that conversion in a sense, we are involved in that because we are repenting and we are the ones who are believing. But when I mean conversion here, I'm really thinking that's rather careless language on my part. And if I can be careless in deliberate lectures, you know how easy it would be for you. So be careful that we do not misstate this. I was using conversion here in the sense of regeneration. And that work, you see, is the work of the Spirit of God alone. So what I mean in eight is the minister can't regenerate, the sinner can't regenerate, only the Spirit can regenerate. Nine, the seeker is asking him to do just that. He knows and acknowledges that his salvation is owing to a sovereign Holy Spirit. Not only that this glorifies the Spirit and the way in which it describes seeking, but the seeker himself glorifies the Holy Spirit throughout the whole process in indicating clearly that he depends upon the Holy Spirit, and if he is ever converted, it is owing only to the Holy Spirit. And finally, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, forbearing, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps, may pata, God may perhaps grant that they, these opponents, will repent and come to know the truth and they may escape from the snare of the devil. You see, that's the way we are doing this in accordance with the evangelism of 2 Timothy 2.24 and with full reliance upon the Holy Spirit. We are apt to teach and we set forth the truth as attractively as we can and note, not quarrelsomely, I like that expression of uh, Chesterton uh, whom I've quoted in another connection. He made the remark on one occasion that the trouble with a quarrel is it breaks up a good argument. You see, we will argue with people, we'll reason with people. They don't accept Christianity lying down they're not going to believe it just because you say it's true. They're going to question you and very properly and legitimately, and you have to be ready with reasons for the faith that is in you. You're, you're not quarrelsome, but you're engaged in proper argumentation here, and you're kindly, you make it clear you don't want people to be lost, and you're not trying to alienate them, and you're not saying these things because they're difficult for them to understand. You make one thing plain to the person you're trying to win, that your motives are the best. You are really concerned with their welfare. They can forgive a great deal of your fundamentalism, which bothers them, and which they don't like, and which they say those outrageous things I've mentioned and so on, but in the same process, they know that you mean well, fundamentalist or no fundamentalist, you are out for their souls and their everlasting good. And they can forgive a great deal of your tomfoolery as they see it in that particular kind of, you're correcting, you're showing the error of their ways, but you're doing it not with an obvious desire to win a debate, not to show how much more soundly intellectual you are, not to indicate how stupid and inconsistent they are, you're doing it, you're arguing, you're reasoning, you're trying to show the soundness of your case and the unsoundness and inconsistency of theirs, but you're doing it with a gentleness. It has to be done, and the person realizes it, but it can be done in a way that itself is antagonizing or a way that the way is attractive even when what is said is unattractive. Now, in all of this process of your going away, working with the individual one-on-one, -on -one, becoming all things to all men that you might win one of them and set the angels singing their hallelujahs in heaven because of one sinner who repents. In all of this, God may 
perhaps, perhaps, maybe, possibly. You can't tell any human being you're working with who starts to seek God that he'll find him. If you tell him that, you are not a witness to the truth. You are a liar. You don't know that. But what you can say is, maybe God will convert you. Perhaps he will grant that they, you, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, will repent and come to know the truth. See, that's a surprising statement. I like the King James Version a little better because it talks about acknowledging the truth. You see, these people know the truth because you're teaching it to them. You're not quarrelsomely doing it, but the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly an apt teacher. The emphasis is on the communication of a message in a teaching effectively teaching way, and so on. So manifestly they know it. Their problem is they're accepting it. They're acknowledging it. So really what this passage, the word know sometimes is used in the sense of simply have information, and sometimes in the sense of receive the information or acknowledge the information or embrace the information. Now I think this is a bad translation not because the word won't allow, the Greek word won't allow that, but because the context won't allow it. The context indicates, as I say, that these people are being taught, so they have the knowledge. The problem is they're resisting it. But perhaps God will give them repentance about that. And repentance means basically a change of mind, you see. Their mind sets against it now. You present the knowledge, they're getting it, but they don't like it. They're hostile to it, but perhaps God will give them, grant them that they will repent. They'll change their mind and come to know, not in the sense of have information, but act know, acknowledge, yield to, embrace the faith, and thus they may escape from the snare of the devil. Now let's go to the lecture where we should have been at the beginning Lecture 43 on regeneration, the grand event for which the seeker is looking and hoping, and which the evangelist is also hoping God will bestow upon those to whom he preaches so that they will repent of their present position and come to acknowledge the beautiful truth that is being presented in the gospel. Let me read these propositions, and then we'll comment briefly on them. One, the sun is always shining, so is the S-O-N sun. It cannot not shine, neither can he. Two, men are born seeing the S-U-N, but some become blind, we know. Men are born blind to the S-O-N sun, but some receive sight. This isn't an artificial comparison, you know, between the S-U-N and the S-O-N. It's built right into the biblical picture of the S-O-N as the light of the world. He is the one luminary, just as the sun in our heaven is the only luminator of the whole uh, world of ours. So he is there, and so this blindness grows out of the analogy as well. Three, when Christ came... They which sat in darkness saw a great light, Matthew 4, 16. For they saw a great light. Five, revelation is not an unveiling of the portrait, but a removing of the blindness of the beholder. God shines into the darkness, not by turning on his light, but by opening the windows to it. Six, the play has always been a success. It was the audience that was the failure. The play was brilliant. The audience was bat blind. What was needed was not for God to shine. He always shone, but for the mind and heart of men to be opened. Seven, the illumination of God comes by the regeneration. Eight, 
This makes the sinner a new creature with a new set of eyes. Nine, man was created with spiritual eyes, which he lost by the fall. God opened the eyes of Israel, his chosen people. Now the poor, unbelieving Jews, quote, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds, 2 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15. 10, alas, a veil lies over Christian eyes. Christian in quotes, you'll know. They never see the true Jesus any more than the Jews see the true Moses. They see the Jesus of the last temptation or the myth of God incarnate or the Christ of their own imagination. They must be born again if they ever are to see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the God-man, Matthew 16, 17. Need to develop these first couple points a bit. The sun is always shining. We know that. And so is the S-O-N, always shining. Christ cannot not shine. His glory is always shining for. It's held back a bit, but it's always shining for those who have spiritual eyes to see it. It cannot not shine. The sun, sun couldn't stop shining, and neither can the S-O-N stop shining. That is his nature. He's the effulgence of the divine glory. He's the outflashing of it. He's a shining forth of it. Two, but men are born seeing the sun, the S-U-N, but some do, alas, become blind so that they cannot see it. Men are born blind, however, to the S-O-N. See, they're born with eyesight with respect to the S-U-N. They are born blind with respect to the S-O-N, but some receive sight. I'm saying we are naturally able to see the S-U-N, but some of us unfortunately lose that natural ability, becoming blind. With respect to the S-O-N, who's always shining, we're born blind, and some actually are given sight. Just exactly the opposite uh, pattern in these two spheres of illumination. Three, when Christ came, they which sat in darkness saw a great light. See, that was the first thing said about Jesus and Matthew. As soon as he appeared on the scene, the people to whom he appeared were in Stygian darkness. They were groping around. They didn't know God at all. They were later described as sheep without a shepherd. They were just lost. Here they're just described as blind. And mind you, they're the people of God he's talking about. Israel, but nevertheless in Israel it's lost its spiritual sight. Christ, therefore, the light of the world, when he comes, he comes to a people who sit in darkness, who then saw, not all of them, of course, but some of them, a great light, the light which they needed, the light which is life, apart from which there's nothing but darkness and death. They saw a great light. Number five, revelation is not an unveiling of the portrait, but a removing of the blindness of the beholder. God shines into the darkness, not by turning on his light, but by opening the windows to it. I, I don't know whether this is obvious to you or not, but you see, when we use this word light and illumination, we naturally think of a dark room where a light is turned on. But strictly speaking, what we have here is a light which is always on, but the room is dark because it won't admit that light. Your problem is not that you don't have light. Its problem is that there is something blocking the passage of the light. Later on, we'll see it's a veil before the eyes. I sometimes liken it here to a curtain drawn down before the window. 
The light is there. You don't have to go looking for it. The problem is that not that you don't have light, but that you don't have a way of seeing it. You can't see the light. Somehow your eyes have to be open so that the light which is there can shine into them. Number six, you know, I play on this little figure about the play's always been a success. I, I, one of the British playwrights had one of his plays shown in London, and somebody asked him afterwards, was the play a success? And he said, yes, the play was a success, but the audience was a failure. I don't know if that was true about his particular play or not, but we do know with respect to the gospel play, it's a success. It's the audience that's a failure. The audience thinks it's a silly thing. The audience thinks a story of a crucified Jew being the savior of the world is about the most stupid thing they've ever heard. You look like a fool to the Greeks. You can't, you're not with it. You're not alive and sensitive and so on. That you could actually think that this story you're telling me, this story that you tell to the nations and so on, is something worth hearing. Well, yeah, the play's a success, all right. It's a message of God. It's a good news from heaven. It's the best story ever told. What's the trouble? The trouble is with the audience. The play's a success, but the audience is a failure. If George Bernard Shaw was the one who said that, we know George Bernard Shaw's play could be a failure. But it is theoretically possible his play was a success, and the audience was a failure, but it's a theoretical certainty that the gospel is a success, but the audience, what it thinks otherwise, is the failure. It was the audience that was a failure. The play was brilliant. The audience was bat blind. What was needed was not for God to shine. He always shone, but for the mind and heart of men to be open. Seven, the illumination of God comes by the regeneration. This makes the sinner a new creature with a new set of eyes. That's what actually happens. See, the word illumination, you would again think of light coming into a dark room, but actually the illumination comes from within by our seeing for the first time. The light's been there all along, but we, on the other hand, are now capacitated uh, to see it. This makes the sinner a new creature with a new set of eyes. That's what regeneration is all about. He's made a new creature. And as far as light is concerned, the thing that's most important about him are these new eyes he's given when he is made over again. Number nine, man was created with spiritual eyes which he lost by the fall. God opened the eyes of Israel, his chosen people, Amos once said, you only of all the families of the earth have I known. See, he made himself known. He gave Israel eyes to see him. But almost all of Israel, by the time Christ enters the world, has lost its eyesight. And though the sun is shining brightly now, they are hopelessly insensitive to it until eyes are given again by the new birth, a regeneration so that they can see it. Now the poor unbelieving Jews, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. You see, the Jews have suffered a blinding experience through their unbelief. They think they understand Moses and rejected Jesus Christ because they understood Moses when as a matter of fact, if they understood Moses, as Jesus said, they would have come to him. But the fact of the matter is they don't understand Christ, but they don't even understand Moses. And it's not because Moses wasn't lucid enough. It wasn't that the message and revelation through that ancient prophet of God was not clear. There's actually a veil over the Jewish eyes. But mind you, my friends, what the apostle is telling us here in 2 Corinthians is 
that the Jews are blind to Judaism. The Jews are blind to the Old Testament. The blue Jews can't understand Moses. They don't see him. They need new eyes. They need to be born again to understand Moses. You see, we have this fictitious notion that the Jews still believe the Old Testament. They just left the Christian church when Christ and the New Testament came. They were all right as long as the Old Testament was all that was required. They believed the law and the prophets. They're great champions of the Torah and the 39 books of the Old Testament. The problem of the Jews is the fact that they can't accept the New Testament. If it weren't for Christ and Paul and Peter and John, they would still be with us. But what Paul is saying, that is not the problem, basically. The problem is the Jews aren't Jews. The Jews don't believe Judaism. The Jews don't believe the law they profess to believe, the prophets they, the prophets they profess to honor, there's a veil over their eyes when they read Moses. Now, the poor, unbelieving Jews, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is taken away. Yea, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds if a Jew is ever going to be delivered from that veil over his eyes so that he can see Moses, it's going to be by Jesus Christ. Now, you know you've never read that in the newspaper. That's never the way the thing is relayed. It's always fancied that the Jews are right. They really do believe the Old Testament. The fact of the matter is the Jews are wrong. They don't believe in their own religion. They don't believe in the Old Testament. They're absolutely blind to Moses, and the only way they're ever going to understand Moses is by Jesus Christ. Now, let me look in conclusion here at this last point, that a veil lies over Christian eyes. They never see the true Jesus. Christians, in quotes, you'll notice, not true Christians, but as I've said to you several times, most professing Christians don't even understand what Christianity is. They're absolutely blind to it, and when they learn what it is, they find they don't like it. They never see the true Jesus. Ralph, uh, what is it? Uh, I forget his first name, Martin, who writes so much on the cults and so on, has indicated there are about ten different definitions of Jesus running around loose. Now, you know nine of them have to be incorrect. There's a veil before the eyes of the Christians concerning Christ, as a matter of fact. They see the Jesus of the Last Testament, of the myth of God incarnate, of the Christ of their own imagination. They must be born again if they are ever to see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the God-man. That veil, my friends, which is before the Jewish mind, so that it can't even understand Moses, or see Moses, alas, by parallel thinking, is before the Christian mind so that it can't see Christ. Regeneration is necessary for the lifting of the veil so that the light which shines through the whole Bible, through Moses and through Christ, will really be seen, and that comes and comes only by regeneration.